Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Keto and Crime. I am back with my expanded review of Sins of Our Mother, uh, the uh, 2022 docuseries released on September 14th to Netflix. Um, this is a follow-up to our just overview discussion of it that we did live on Monday. I'm hoping to add some more lives to uh, the repertoire coming up, the response to that and to other uh, videos has been tremendous. So I'm just really so grateful for everyone. Also, a lot of comments in my last couple of videos about the tree. Uh, for those of you that are new here or just didn't know, I am, uh, and that is my mother-in-law was a crafter. And part of the benefit of that is that I get to spruce up my office area uh, with the seasons. Now we do leave trees up year round. There's one here, there's one in our family room, but we change it with the holidays. The tree that you were seeing was our Labor Day tree, which has been both Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day. It was a patriotic tree since summer is the season of patriotism. And I guess with the red and everything, it did kind of look, uh, you know, like a tr more traditional Christmas tree. Now we are switching over to a the rest of the house is fall, however, my area is Halloween because Halloween starts as soon as summer's over, in my opinion. And so now I have the Halloween tree complete with skeletons, eyeballs, bats, bats, and I will soon be adding even more Halloween swag to the area. So just wanted to update you there. So with that being said, let's dive into Sins of Our Mother. Sins of Our Mother is a three-episode limited docu-series that launched on the 14th of this month, based heavily off family involvement from Kobe and Kelsey Ryan, Lori Ballow's oldest son and only surviving child, I have to throw that out there, uh, as well as interviews with uh, Janice Cox, um, Lori's mom. Uh, in addition, they draw on police reports, body cam footage, podcasts, uh, text messages, and emails that were released to the filmmakers by virtue of being close to the family. Now, the whole Kobe, you know, arrest being uh, and charges being thrown out aside, I'm going to put that aside for now. If any more breaks on that, I will certainly come back to it. But I'm not going to say that the film in any way influenced that. But this is the main source of it. Also, uh, Justin Lum, who is the uh, young reporter uh, that is also featured in the in the document in the docu series, is an investigative reporter in Arizona that has literally been following this case since the first whisperings of it, and so he supplied a lot of things as well. Uh, in addition, uh, other people that knew them, uh, knew both Chad and Lori were interviewed, our good old buddy Julie Rowe among them. So anyway, definitely uh, a lot of good source material there and source material that a lot of it was not yet released to the public. So I found out a lot of stuff that I did not know before. It goes back to basically talking about Lori. The first episode starts with kind of a background on everything. They talk about Lori's childhood, uh, her marriages up to uh, basically uh, 
the marriage uh, to Charles, which would be her fourth marriage. So it goes through all of those marriages in decent amount of details, particularly uh, the marriage to Joseph Ryan, who is Tally's biological father. Um, Colby carries his name, but he is actually uh, belongs to one of Lori's past husbands. But she did change his name, even though Joseph never officially adopted him. But it kind of moves forward from her being kind of a single mom, uh, still very close to her family. She was always devout LDS, the entire family, from the from the point of view of the documentary, was raised very staunch LDS. They were very faithful in that faith. But somewhere along the way, Lori found herself being sucked into more of the what I call the dark side of LDS, that is the end of times predictions. And uh, she literally, as you watch in the first episode as years go on, she becomes more and more obsessed with that part of the religion. And she was kind of primed. She really believed in the LDS doctrine of being prepped for the end times, how horrible it was going to be, and just being prepared to be there and to stand you know, for Christ and protect your family. So she really got into that. But we don't really see that dark side starting to emerge until after her marriage to Joseph Ryan fell apart. And it fell apart because of abuse allegations, both sexual and otherwise, towards both Tylee and uh j and uh not jj but a colby excuse me um and from there you kind of see everything start to fall apart for lori there was a time where uh, her brother alex who will eventually become kind of a hitman for the cult uh basically attempted to take out uh, joseph ryan at one point um by uh well he describes it uh, in detail in a stand-up routine he did but uh, basically ends up serving some prison time for that. And so after that, the marriage fell apart, of course. And then you hear Lori literally in both taped conversations and through text messages say that she never thought she would be that up for killing someone as she was to kill Joe after what happened with Kobe and Tylee. And so that is the point where you start to see that happy family you wanted a husband and children and a more traditional Mormon way of life thought she had achieved, so, but unfortunately it didn't pan out. Then she meets Charles, uh, an elite salesperson, makes a lot of money. They end up getting married and uh, living in uh, Gilbert, Arizona for a while, seem to be very happy. They adopt um, Charles's great nephew, JJ. Uh, he was the grandson of Charles's um, sister and brother-in-law, the Woodcocks, uh, by a sibling that was drug addicted and could not care for him. He was autistic. He had a lot of special needs that the Woodcocks did not think they could handle. So they asked Charles and Lori, who they loved Lori. They seemed to be a very happy family. Uh, he, he got along well with Kobe. He loved Tylee. It seemed to be that all-American family that Lori had desired. And they ended up adopting him. And then they moved to Kauai, Hawaii for a while and ended up. And if you want a more in-depth on their family, you can definitely check out one of my videos up here where I followed the whole case. The facts known at the time that I did the video. And they ended up moving to Kauai for a while. And in Kauai, they lived a very idealistic lifestyle. Charles, Lori, JJ, Tylee, and Kobe. They seemed to be the happiest they'd ever been in their life. But one thing was kind of sticking around. That darkness that Lori um, had taken on after the collapse of the Ryan marriage kind of carried over into this current marriage. And as a result, she clung more and more to her faith. And that put her even more in the dark mindset of the end times. And she began to see herself as very holy, the only one that knows. This is the period of time between now and when they moved back to Arizona that she was quoted as saying that the end times are going to be so terrible she might as well just drive off a cliff and take her entire family with her. Just very dark and she began to see herself as much more holy and devout than Charles. Charles 
did convert to LDS, but I think he did it uh, just to pacify Lori. It really wasn't his thing, at least from what I gather. And their marriage began to suffer. And it was also during this particular time, and then uh, in this particular episode, that she meets Chad Daybell, who was an apocalyptic author, as we all know. Like Lori, he saw himself as more than he was, and he had his own theories about the end time and his role in them. And his religion, his fictional religion became her fictional religion, and they began having an affair. Episode one ends basically with um, a conversation between Alex and Lori uh, about zombies. This is where Chad's zombie theory first began to infiltrate about who was a zombie, at what level they were, according to... Uh, Reports of people that knew them, uh, Chad had devised a zombie chart, you know, going from dark to light with different numbers, and basically, um, Lori was light, he was light, of course, everybody that was on their side was light, Alex was light, uh, but, um, Kobe was light, but his wife Kelsey was dark, and another person that was considered dark was Charles, and this basically ends with a text conversation between Lori and Alex saying that Charles or his zombie alias must be eliminated. And then the next episode, it closes on a very good cliffhanger. It makes you want to click right over to the next episode. It begins with the shooting of Charles Vallow, all the cam footage, the interview of Lori and Tylee that we've all seen, uh, and basically just, um, them playing up getting away with murder in my opinion and then from there it's all about the motives for those killings you that's where you sh see that um k was now the beneficiary on charles's uh life insurance uh you know the first episode also showed how charles was trying to talk to adam one of the brothers about and how adam was interacting with him and how adam was now dark and so you see it it progressing in story in story time and then you get to the point of the second episode where now both Tylee and JJ are missing and again it ends on a very good cliffhanger uh, and then it opens pretty much on the death of Tammy Daybell and then uh, with all the speculation around that, his uh, the grave being exhumed and Alex's untimely death. And then we get into the search of the Daybell uh, property and then the finding of the bodies. And then here we are. And it documents everything, like I said, through podcast recordings, through recorded phone calls, through police reports, body cam footage, text messages. Um, it reminded me a lot of the uh, docu-series, or documentary really, not a docu-series, that was done on the Watts murders, which I have also covered. I'll link it up here, and as well as my review of that movie right up there. Um, it reminded me a lot of that because it was a lot of text messages, uh, emails, audio phone calls that we perhaps hadn't seen before. Uh, but it was, there was no narrative with that one. It was just letting the text messages and everything tell the story. This takes a similar path in that it shows everything via text, email, podcast, recorded phone call, but there's also narration, uh, from people being interviewed that backs up those statements. And the main people being interviewed are Janice Cox, uh, Kelsey, and Kobe Ryan, as well as some police officers and uh, other friends of the family, uh, distant relatives, there's a former sister-in-law, Lori's on there. Uh, so a lot of family members that we have not heard from before. Um, the Woodcocks, as, as I can recall, do not really appear in this documentary in that they are not like an actual participating member, but they are there via other interviews they have done. So they've taken clips of the, those and put them in there, though they themselves are not in the documentary. I don't know if that was uh by choice or they just decided not to ask them but they are not actually represented in the flesh in the documentary overall i think it was 
a very well done documentary. It takes the entire story and lays it out without a whole lot of dramatization like the uh, Lifetime movie that I reviewed. Uh, a lot of dramatization there, but here there wasn't. It was just straight up from the facts, from the records, from people that know them. And like I said, I found out a lot of stuff that I didn't know before. For example, I didn't know exactly how many times Charles Vallow had gone to the proper authorities to get help and was denied. I didn't know how many times Kobe had begged his mother to just to tell him where the kids were. I did not see the true pain of the Woodcocks until this documentary, and I also saw a different side of Lori's fam mother that they really did not... Uh, at first they defended her, but then Janice later apologized and said she shouldn't. But it's still her daughter, so I understand that. I also gave me a whole new appreciation for Tylee. Some of the stuff they showed, you know, videos, pictures, text messages from Tylee. Just what a wonderful human being she was. And it really made me uh, feel for her. Um, it also helped me see that both Chad and Laurie are equally responsible for this. They're both cuckoo cuckoo and they fed off each other. I don't think any of these murders would have ever happened, any of these deaths would ever have happened if they hadn't met each other. I think it was just a perfect storm of crazy. And this docu-series really brings that out and it really drives that point home. And it sets the stage for the trial in 2023. And so with that being said, out of five stars, I give this five stars. You know, it, it is a documentary. You have to remember that. There are two types of documentaries. There are ones where they just turn on the camera, aim it at the subject, and let what happens happens with absolutely no interjection from the crew. And then there's ones where the documentarian has a point of view, and they are using that um, documentary to put forth their point of view. Uh, good examples of this would be the documentary uh, Kidnapped for Christ is just a turn on the camera and let it roll and see what happens. It's a very good um, personification, uh, same with uh, Jesus Camp, very good personification of a just turn on the camera and let it roll kind of documentary with no opinion, just what happened. And then there are document, uh, any Michael Moore film, uh, Super Size Me by Morgan Spurlock, any other type of documentary would fall into the camp of they have an agenda and they're trying to put forth that agenda. This docuseries, like the Watts docuseries, kind of falls in the middle. It's about 60% turn on the camera and let it roll. But then there's that 40% where you know they, they believe that Lori and Chad are guilty, as well as, you know, in the Watts, they believe Chris Watts was guilty. That was obvious from the way things were framed, but they also did not manipulate the evidence, in my opinion. They just let it play out and let the evidence speak for itself, even though you could tell by the tone that they believed these people were guilty. And so that's what you kind of have to take into mind when watching this. They definitely believe they're crazy and that they're guilty. And Stephanus brings up the whole you know, is this going to affect the trial, uh, the jury? I mean, they've already moved the trial to Boise, I believe, for the trial so they can get an untainted jury. But as just like with the Watts trial, any case that gets the exposure of this case, the Gabby Petito case, the Jody Arias case, the Lacey Peterson case, uh, the Casey Anthony case, any crime like that, it's going to be almost impossible to get a completely untainted jury because it gets such national attention. So yes, this documentary will affect the trial. Uh, there's no way around it. But I also truly believe in my heart of hearts with the preponderance of the evidence laid before me. And I may be shocked in the trial, but from what I know, I believe they're guilty as homemade sin. And I will only change my mind on that if I'm slapped in the face by God himself and he hands me the complete and utter story, if God exists. And so that's kind of how I feel about it. Uh, it's a great documentary. It's definitely worth a watch. It's uh, three episodes, but it'll take about three hours and 20 minutes of your time to watch all three episodes. I highly recommend checking it out. And they do an excellent job of building tension, building up to a cliffhanger, and you wanting to advance right on to the next episode. 
So I highly recommend it. If you have Netflix, go check it out, Sins of Our Mother. I will be back very soon with another true crime or dark history video. And until then, keep doing crime. Out.